Thanks for joining us today. We are happy that you are here and we just pray that you are blessed by what goes on in this service today. So I'm gonna pray to get us started. So let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day. I thank you that we have technology, that we can join as one body and uh, we can be together. And no matter where people are at, they can listen to this sermon, Father. I hope that they are blessed today by the music and the speaking and everything that goes on here. We love you and we thank you for the opportunity to get to worship you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're joining us online today. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the ministers here at LHCC. And I just want to invite you just to join me as we worship our God together.
slippery You stand faster and can't escape Your faithfulness and endless sea So full of grace and mercy We sing God is so good God is so good God is so good He's so good to me Yes, you are Yes, you are Haunted by the past no more Forgiveness, forgiveness flows from your veins. Your kindness shows in all your ways. We see God is so good. Oh God is so good. God is so good, He's so good to me. There's never been anyone like you, never been anyone like you. You are worthy, you are worthy, yeah. Christ alone. He's my rock, my shield, my cornerstone. We sing God is so good. God is so God, we thank you that you are faithful, that you're kind, that you're good. The Bible says that you work all things for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. That you walk with us even on the darkest, day, darkest of days. We can be confident that our God is with us. 
we thank you that we can just hold to your promises and that you are good and faithful, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. That your goodness is just so heavily displayed on the cross when Jesus offered his life as a sacrifice to pay a debt that we could. Thank you for your love that you've shown towards us, your kindness. We thank you for Jesus and what he's accomplished and what he's done. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for singing with us today. Uh, we are moving to a time known as communion. And what this is, is just a time for us as Christians to reflect and, uh, on our relationship with Christ uh, and allow him to speak to our hearts. And so here in just a moment, we're going to take bread and take juice. And these things represent Jesus' body and his blood that was sacrificed for you and for me. So here in just a moment, we're going to take that together as a church family. You know, even though we're meeting together in our building now, there are many of you who are, are worshiping online, and we really appreciate you doing that. Every Lord's Day, Lincoln Hills, we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and uh, I'm praying that you have your elements ready to participate in the Lord's Supper today. I love what John writes in 1 John, the beginning of this chapter, where he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ we write this to make our joy complete what a fascinating description almost capsulating everything that God has done through Jesus Christ God created everything through with Jesus uh, these witnesses were eyewitnesses. John says, we saw him, we touched him, we heard the word of life, and we bring to you life eternal through him. And I love this part where it says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And we write this to make our joy complete. What a joyous thing it is to know that we fellowship with God, the Father, the Creator the one who loves us so much that he gave Jesus for our salvation. So each Lord's Day as we gather around this Lord's table, we take the bread and we take the cup, the body and blood of Jesus are represented there, and the great fellowship that we enjoy with the Father and the Son, and then we also fellowship with the Holy Spirit who lives in us if we are in Christ. So what joy that could bring to us in our lives every day. So I'm going to pray and then we will participate in the Lord's Supper together in fellowship. And uh, I am so glad you're worshiping with us today. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for your love for us, for the joy of our salvation that comes through fellowship with you through Jesus. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents his broken body this cup that represents his shed blood. So Lord, make our joy complete by causing us to reflect, to remember, to repent, to give ourselves to you in a fresh way today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The bread that represents the body of Jesus. The cup that represents the shed blood that the Lord shed for each one of us. You know, one of the joys in life is to be able to help people and to give to something that's greater than ourselves. Uh, you have been doing that marvelously through this uh, COVID-19 crisis and 
We really appreciate that as a staff and, and we are able to do our ministry and you are a part of that. You know, we talked about the fellowship and the Lord's Supper, but the fellowship of giving, where we come together and we put our resources together for missionary work, for uh, helping people locally, uh, for uh, having a beautiful place to worship in, and all those things that go with what happens with our resources. So today, celebrate the fact that we get to give. We don't have to, but we have an opportunity to if we choose. So we invite you to be a part of our giving, and uh, on the screen you will see how you may give in, in various ways. So let's pray for our giving today. Father, we worship you with our gifts. We bring them to you, knowing, Lord, that you will multiply these gifts in various ways. Father, thank you for the willingness of people who will give up part of what you have blessed them with to celebrate and to to support ministry in this world. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to give back a portion of what you have given to us. And we ask your blessing on these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not take your money out. This is real. Look, if there's one takeaway other than a plus 400 somebody, Bear Stearns is not in trouble. I mean, if anything, they're more likely to be taken over. Don't move your money from Bear. That's just being silly. The closing numbers on the markets today. At one point, the market fell uh, as if down a well over 700 points. Well, Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between 3 and 4.5% and generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere, essentially, down by 4 or 5%. We're down over 16%. The Dow, at the same time, has fallen about 18%. The stock market is now down 21%. Because we're now down 43%. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Almost everything there completely wiped out. And the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped out. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. I don't blame them. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be joining you today for worship. Over the last five weeks or so, We've tried to establish some ideas and principles that will help us as followers of Jesus to be more financially balanced and live as examples of stability for the world around us when everything seems to be turned upside down. Our conviction is that as followers of Jesus, if we can be positive examples for our friends and our neighbors, we'll have lots of opportunities to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. In our very first week together, we said that there are three principles or laws of physical balance that when applied to our money can help us find balance there as well. Those laws were the law of the reference point or laser focus on a target. The law of constant correction, meaning that we're always making tweaks and adjustments when they're necessary. And finally, the law of the clear objective, that what's the one thing the one goal, the one objective that we have that supersede all of the others. If you'll recall, that goal for our finances as followers of Jesus is to honor God with all that we have. Not just a percentage, but everything that we have should honor God because everything that we have belongs to God and everything that we have has been given to us by Him. So while we're entrusted with it, we should manage it well. It's through this filter, how do I honor God with all of my wealth, that Chris, Webby, and I have talked about some of the corrections that we may need to consider making in regard to our debt, in regard to our extra, and regard to our spending habits. If followers of Jesus are all about honoring God with all that we have, then we won't run up a bunch of debt. We won't hoard money or resources or food while our neighbors go without. Last week, we talked about the craving that we have for more in regard to our spending. We actually said that this is an appetite that needs to be uh, addressed not by feeding it, but by starving it. Paul's words to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, he said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. The one idea that I want you to walk away from this particular sermon and this series overall is this, the direction and priority of our money or reflect the direction and priority of our heart. Remember the words that we quoted 
uh, of Jesus back in the very first week together. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 says, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. By the time we're finished today, I'd like for us to all have a game plan or a strategy for stability in regard to our finances. The truth is there is a limited number of things that we can actually do with our money. We can spend it. We can repay our debts, we can pay our taxes, we can save or invest it, or we can give it away. Let me go through that list again. We can spend it, we can repay debts, we can pay taxes, we can save or invest, or we can give it all away. Not only is this about all we can do with money, this is generally the order that we choose to use our money. Unfortunately, this does not represent a strategy for stability. If followers of Jesus continue to navigate life using this approach, we will regularly find ourselves running out of money before we run out of month. But even more problematic is this. This is not the example that Jesus himself set for us to follow. To honor God and follow Jesus, we must be willing to take this old model and flip it on its head. A stable strategy looks more like this. Give to God our first and best, save for the future, and live on the rest. Give to God our first and best, save for the future, and live on the rest. Please hear me when I say we're not looking for you to give more money to the church. We've said throughout this series that this series is not about trying to twist anybody's arm to give more money to Lincoln Hills Christian Church. In fact, this series about, is about helping us all live more financially in balance so that we can make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I'm not suggesting that we all need to give God more, but I'm absolutely suggesting that followers of Jesus should want to give Him our first and our best. That's how Jesus lived. God's kingdom and God's concerns took priority over His own. Jesus wasn't satisfied to give God His leftovers And we shouldn't be either. Frank, is this strategy suggesting that I don't pay my electric bill or my mortgage? Well, no, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pay your electric bill or your mortgage. But what I am saying is that you don't pay them first. A place to sleep and electric are important. I mean, they're important parts of living in America in the 21st century. We need those things, but they should come after God and after saving for the future. You heard that right. Before you pay your water bill, I'm suggesting that you pay your future self. I mean, think about what's written in Proverbs chapter 21. It says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And then in verse 20, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. I think what the writer is saying here in this proverb is pretty clear. There is immense value in thinking past the here and now and considering what may be needed in the future. The message puts verse 5 like this. It says, careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry puts you further behind. Unfortunately, I think this is where many have found themselves during this most recent season. Too many have operate under the spend first and save and give eventually mentality. And that model brought luxury and nice things at the time. But when the entire world turned upside down, they were left hurrying and scurrying. They found themselves in holes that now they're concerned they may never climb out of. When we get paid, our first check should go to God. The first check that we write should be to Him because everything is His anyway. Don't get hung up on percentages or on specific amounts. Just give Him the best that you can right now, right where you are. As your circumstances change, make the corrections that you need to. The second check that we should write should be to our future selves. No matter how small the check is, the value is is in the habit as much as it is in the actual amount of the check. Again, as our circumstances change, so too should the amount that we pay our future selves. 
It's okay that there's ebb and flow in the system because that's where the value of constant correction is actually felt. Give to God our first and best, save for the future, and live on the rest. After we've considered how we can honor God with all that we have first, above all else, and after we've considered what we may need for the future and pay our future selves, then we live on the rest. It's from here that our bills get paid and our subscriptions get renewed. It's from here that we go out to eat and buy birthday presents. It's from here that we buy that new gun that we've had our eye on or the purse that we've wanted for so long. We treat ourselves last. We pamper and spoil ourselves after everything else. Why? Well, I could give you a long list of reasons why, but primarily, when did you ever see Jesus treating himself. On what occasions do we find Jesus spoiling or pampering himself? I'm not saying that we can't ever do those things, but if the followers of Jesus are going to follow his example, our comforts should come last. Remember what he told his first followers. He says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. When we put ourselves last, our desires, that's exactly what we're doing. We're denying ourselves what we might want in any given moment so that we can be more faithful followers of Jesus. One day Jesus was teaching in the temple courts and he was asked what was the greatest of God's commandments. And he responded this way in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What's really interesting is what Jesus says a moment later. You see, sometimes we'll read a familiar passage of scripture or a familiar verse and we'll remove it from its larger context and miss the overall picture. So with Jesus having just explained, in essence, what the what's most valuable in God's economy, he turns and says this in verse 38. Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. To be clear, in context, Jesus is in the temple courts and he's likely surrounded by tons and tons and tons of teachers of the law. And it's here that he basically calls them fakers and phonies and frauds and condemns them for their selfish behavior, for putting themselves above others and taking advantage of society's most vulnerable people. Those people, the teachers of the law, should have been shining examples of loving God and loving others when in reality, according to Jesus, they loved only themselves. With this in mind, we're told this in verse 41. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They All gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Here's what you can't miss about this passage and about this series. The direction and priority of this woman's money reflected the direction and priority of her heart. She was closer to God than all of those religious leaders. And how do we know that? She gave God her first and her best. She loved God with all that she had. She put herself last. Jesus detested the self-serving religious activity of the teachers of the law, but celebrated the sacrifice and selflessness of this poor widow. She understood better than those teachers of the law that everything comes from God and everything belongs to God. Honoring him was her priority because God had her heart. And if we are going to do likewise, we need a strategy for financial stability. And it looks like this. Give to God our first and best, save for the future, and live 
on the rest. For those of us who follow Jesus, this isn't optional because following him means living like him and valuing the things that he valued. We can't wholeheartedly follow Jesus and continue to put uh, our stuff and ourselves first. It's just not possible. What I want for us and what I believe God wants for us is stability. That, is, that his people will, will no longer be stressed out or worn down because of their finances. Instead, we live as shining examples for others. Our lives should prove that it's not only possible to put God first and live with joy, but it is necessary to put God first to live with joy. And, and maybe, here, here's the deal. maybe you want that kind of joy, but you've never chosen to follow Jesus. Maybe you've been living your whole life just for you. Maybe you know firsthand that you can pursue all kinds of stuff and you can have joy, but that joy doesn't last, that it evaporates like a mist. If that's you, I want you to know that there's hope in Jesus. You can repent of your sins. You can change directions. You can switch allegiance. You can be baptized into Christ and you can start fresh. All your problems won't go away. Make make no mistake. All your problems aren't going to instantly vanish, but you won't have to deal with those problems on your own. If you'd like to start following Jesus, but you're just not sure what your next step looks like, send us a message. Reach, reach out to us on Facebook or email us at info at lincolnhillschristian.com and I think we can probably help make your next step a little bit more clear. If you just need somebody to pray with you, again, send us a message, email us at lincolnhillschristian.com so that we can be praying for you and supporting you through whatever it is that you're going through. We really hope that this series has helped you and been beneficial for you. Our goal is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And that's possible when God has our entire hearts. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for providing for us. Thank you for giving to us your son, Jesus. Help us to model him for the world around us. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Sing Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you, we live for you. There is no one like There is none beside. Open up my eyes in wonder and show who you are and fill with your heart and me. In your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh God, we live for you. Oh, oh there is no one. There is nothing beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show who you are and fill with your heart and keep me in your love to those around me. Holy I'll build my life. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. 
God, we thank you that we can come together as the body of Christ and just to worship and lift up the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Thank you that we can just completely trust who you are. That we can just lean everything on you and just know that you are good and that you are our protector and our provider and the one who takes care of us. And that we can, just as this song says, we can build our life upon you. Because you are tried and you are true. And all your promises are yes and amen. But you're faithful and you're good. You're strong. We can trust you, God. Thank you so much for this time. Just to sing and just lift up the name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray.